thank you all for being here. And uh, let's, uh, let's talk about cryptography a little bit. But uh, before I start, I would like to emphasize that this talk is way more operational than it is theoretical. Uh, there are gonna be details I skip, and I can't make you a cryptographer with an hour of PowerPoint. But what I'm hoping I can do is give you a little bit better intuition about the tools that cryptography provides and how you use those things uh, correctly and effectively in Go. So if you've talked about cryptography at all before, you've probably been told one particular thing over and over again, which is the clicker isn't working. <laughs> um, fuck it, I'll just hit arrows. Try, try. No. Oh, yes. All right. Fuck. Yes. Nope. Oh, boy. All right, I'm, I'm gonna stand here and hit arrows. Um, old school. So you've probably been told over and over again not to write your own crypto. And we say this to people in person, we say it on the internet, we write you know, long rants on mailing lists about it. Uh, and it's actually a bit of a problem because people misunderstand what we mean. And they take it to be uh, don't write any code that uses cryptography or don't write any security code at all. Leave it to the adults. You're not smart enough, right? So when we say don't write your own crypto, we, we end up discouraging people from, from even trying to learn the basics. Uh, and I'm here basically to say this is ridiculous. Even at CoreOS, which is a relatively small company, I, I can't possibly write all of the security code that we need done every day. So. Uh, you know, by systematically discouraging people from learning how to do that safely on their own, I'm actually making my job harder. And I'm hoping today to fix that a little bit. Because what we mean when we say don't write your own crypto is actually something a little more subtle. It's actually more like don't write your own crypto algorithms. Because try as hard as you might, you're not going to invent a better version of AES. Uh, you won't come up with a new signature alg algorithm that's better than the ones that already exist because there are about five people in the world who can actually do that. None of them are here today, and about half of them are Daniel Bernstein. <laughs> uh, he designs the algorithms, and we use them. And this is a little frustrating to people who like to invent their own stuff, but for developers like us, it's actually fantastic because it means that we don't have to write our own crypto. Uh, the hard work has been done by DJB and people like him. So we are left with this overflowing toy box of cryptographic tools that we can use to build things. And you actually can think of them a little bit like cryptographic Legos. Uh, they're, they come in different shapes. Some of them are different colors. They occasionally make weird noises when you try to force them together in the wrong way. But as developers, we don't really care about any of that because at the end of the day, what we actually want to do is take those building blocks and use them to produce security. But much like with Legos, it's hard to get from there to there. You need instructions. You need something to tell you what to actually do with all the different blocks in order to build something that's secure. So, if you kept talking to your cryptographer friend past that first sentence, they probably then said something like, use TLS for data in motion, and use GPG for data at rest. And TLS and GPG are acronyms, but what they really are are recipes for taking a set of cryptographic algorithms and turning them into a security outcome. TLS in particular is for 
pieces of software talking to each other across the network. So, you know, web browser, web server, chat client, chat server, uh, even, even for peer-to-peer -peer things like uh, two nodes in an etcd cluster trying to run leader election. All of these things will use TLS. And Go makes it really easy to use TLS securely. Uh, you'll see here that what I'm doing is creating an HTTP client with a, uh, a TLS config. And all you need to set in that TLS config to use uh, uh, this client securely is the min version parameter. And all you need to do is say min version TLS 1.2. We want TLS 1.2 because Go specifically doesn't have mitigations for an attack called Lucky 13. And if we use versions of TLS lower than 1.2, uh, Go will sometimes be forced to use uh, insecure compatibility options that'll leave us open to attacks that we would just as soon avoid. It's actually the same on the server side, but for one thing. We still set the min version to be TLS 1.2. And then we set this additional flag, prefer server cipher suites. And what this says is that for our listener, we want to use Go's defaults for TLS and not the defaults of whatever client is connecting to us uh, is asking for. We do this because Go knows best and the priority that it applies to all of the options, uh, to all of the cipher suites, are tuned to resist a whole bunch of TLS attacks already. So we let Go take care of us and everything works out well. And there's one caveat to this though, which is that choosing TLS 1.2 is a compatibility trade-off. There are old machines, old services that don't understand 1.2 and by choosing this, we'll not be able to talk to them. But since we're writing Go and we're probably talking to other Go services or if we're talking to something remote, it's likely to be a service hosted by a modern company like Google or Cloudflare who actually get this right. So because we're working in Go, we can go ahead and make this trade off every time and it'll work out pretty well. So the second part of this mantra, GPG for data at rest. GPG is a encryption tool that's really, <laughs> that's really meant for uh, people communicating with each other rather than software. It's meant for encrypting email or signing a document that you're going to put up on the internet somewhere so everybody knows it's you. And here's how you use GPG securely. How you use GPG securely is that you don't use GPG. It is beyond human comprehension. This man page is nearly 17,000 words long. And you can go read it like I have, but at the end of that, you're going to have questions like, who do I really trust? And what is an armored detached signature? Why might I want one? Do I need a bunker to go with that? <laughs> and so we're just gonna skip all of that and say that you know, if you are Edward Snowden, you might need GPG. And if you're not, you probably don't, and it shouldn't be what you reach for when you think of encrypting data. In fact, none of the rest of this talk is about the standard recommendations. It's not about TLS, it's not about GPG. Because when you're writing security code, uh, you don't generally need those things to solve your problems. There's a layer at which they apply, and then everything beyond that, everyday tasks like hashing files, authenticating an API, uh, storing a password for websites aren't applicable. You can't use TLS to uh, you know, sign a JWT or generate a random UID. Uh, in fact, you really, can't, you really can't apply TLS to anything other than the problem for which it's suited. But it's okay because again, we're writing Go and Go gives us all of the tools that we need to do these things and to do them well. But the problem with Go Crypto is that it gives us a bunch of other options too. And if you only take one thing away from this talk, it should be the following sentence. Just because it's in the crypto package 
doesn't mean it's good. And it's easy to demonstrate this by looking at a list of all of the things that the crypto package provides. You can see it's vast and full of really old algorithms that you actually wouldn't ever want to use in 2016. And if we start talking about the column on the left, encryption, we'll very quickly see like, just how many of those things we can eliminate. Because when you're trying to encrypt something in the year 2016 using Go, you definitely don't want DES. Oh, fuck. Or PowerPoint. Yeah, so anyway, um, you don't want DES, triple DES, RC4, T, XT, Blowfish, cast or Cast5. These are all just completely non-applicable. You don't want to use them. They're, they're there for historical legacy reasons, but they aren't sufficiently secure for the modern day in most cases. And these last three, 2Fish, Salsa20, and AES, are actually the ones you want. They're all, uh, they're all modern encryption methods that will be just fine to use. But there's an additional subtlety here, which is that on most modern platforms, AES has hardware acceleration. So it's very, very fast. And 2Fish and Salsa20 don't. So just like everyone else in the world, we're going to use AES here. But there's a specific way that we need to use AES. And I'll illustrate it with this example. Uh, we're taking here an input string, quick brown fox. We're generating 32 random bytes to use as a secret key. We're initializing a cipher.block interface with AES here. And then we notice that cipher.block has an encrypt function, which takes a variable length slice. So of course, we call AES.encrypt. That sounds reasonable, right? And it is, if you don't really know what it's doing. I've seen perfectly competent developers make exactly this mistake, uh, even, even in Go. So I'll give you a second to think through this and see if you can figure out why it's catastrophically broken. And I'll show you what it does when you run it. So we have our input, quick round fox, and what we'd really expect as output here is a bunch of noise. It's, it's encrypted data. It's, it's meaningless unless you have the secret key. But what we actually get is that string on the bottom, where you can see there's a little bit of noise, but then like the rest of that buffer looks pretty familiar. And in fact, it's most of our message. Most of our input string has not been encrypted here. Because what the AES block cipher does is encrypts 16 bytes of data. That's it, that's all it does. It encrypts 16 bytes of data uh, every time. And so when we call, call AES.encrypt here, that's all we're doing. We replace the first 16 bytes with pr uh, properly encrypted stuff, and the rest of it we leak. So if you're a developer who thought they were encrypting because you were able to pass an arbitrary length slice, you're in fact not, and you're gonna be very surprised when some pen tester points this out in a year. The lesson here is that all block ciphers are like that. We never want to use a cipher block interface directly. Instead, uh, what we're gonna do, and this is going to be a bit of a pattern, is we're gonna take that primitive algorithm and build something on top of it that gets us the security properties we actually want. And in the case of block ciphers, uh, those are called modes. So we're gonna use a block cipher mode, and if you go into the Go packages and look for cipher.block mode, you'll see, again, that we have a bunch of options. But also, again, no, 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 no. You only want one. You want GCM, which stands for a Galois counter mode, but that's really not important right now. In fact, none of the details of GCM are important at all. But what you need to know is that it implements the cipher.aead uh, interface, where that stands for authenticated encryption with associated data. And what authenticated encryption means is that not only are your, uh, is your data going to be confidential, secret, encrypted, it's also now going to be tamper-proof. 
if someone alters the ciphertext, the, the encrypted data, you will not then be able to validly decrypt it. And you want this because there are a lot of attacks, particularly that make the news in the context of TLS, that are predicated upon being able to mess with ciphertext that you know someone is then going to try to decrypt incorrectly. So when you're using authenticated encryption and someone messes with your data, it just fails to decrypt and you're not vulnerable to attacks like that. But introducing a block cipher mode means that we have to do some extra stuff. Particularly, we need to do this. You can see, like in the bad example, we're initializing the block cipher with a secret key. But then we're also creating a GCM object. And once we've got that, we never touch the block cipher again. We always interact with GCM. GCM encryption takes an additional parameter called a nonce, which is just a piece of data that should not be repeated. Nonce comes from the phrase number used once, and it, and it is that. Terrible things will happen to your data if you repeat the combination of a key and a GCM nonce. So you don't do that. You should never repeat a nonce. And that seems like it would imply a lot of bookkeeping that would be really annoying. But luckily, NIST, the cryptographic standards body, has told us that if we just use sufficiently large random numbers, it's probably okay. So that's what we do here. We, we, make a, we make a byte slice of the right size, which is just a parameter of GCM. We read random bytes into it. And then we use the GCM seal function, which is the, uh, which is the way that you encrypt data under authenticated encryption modes. It's called seal. You can see here what it's doing is it takes, a, it takes an output slice, the nonce, the data you want to encrypt, and an extra parameter that you can almost always ignore. Um, <laughs> it does things, but it's not worth explaining. So. What I'm doing here is I'm reusing the nonce slice so that the output of this function will be a, a chunk of data with the nonce at the beginning and the encrypted data after it. And we'll store them as one chunk for convenience because the nonce doesn't need to be secret, it just needs to be unique. So when we get over to the decrypt side, you'll see that we do the same thing, block cipher, GCM, but then we call the GCM version of decrypt, which is called open, and it also takes uh, an output slice to append to the nonce, the encrypted data, and another parameter that you can ignore. And you'll see that because of the way I structure those blobs, I can actually just extract the nonce from the ciphertext blob. And we can store those wherever we want to store our encrypted data, and we don't have to worry about keeping some sort of map between you know, encrypted data and which nonce we used. So that's encryption. And the next set of things that I'd like to talk about are hashes. And for a little refresher, a hash is a function that takes a piece of data and maps it into something that is difficult to predict and difficult to reverse. So you look at a hash and you, and you know nothing about what data produced it, but you also know that it was different from any other data with a different hash. And Go gives us a bunch of these, as usual. But since I'm guessing you get the theme of the talk so far, does anyone care to guess which one of these we'll use? Well, the man in the front's got it. You might think we'd use SHA-3, because the number is the biggest, and it's the newest. <laughs> uh, but in fact, the reason we have SHA-3 is not necessarily because it's better than SHA-2, but because it is different than SHA-2. Uh, a few years ago, cryptographers as a whole started getting concerned that all of our hash algorithms were too similar, and if we do find a problem with them, they'll all go away at once. So we ran a contest, SHA-3 was the winner, and it was the winner uh, particularly because it's a good hash function, but also because its inner workings are entirely different from MD4, MD5, SHA-1, SHA-2, or really any other hash function you're used to. But it's also not very widely used yet. So if you need SHA-3, you're going to know you need SHA-3. For everything else, there's SHA-2. But like with encryption, 
we're actually not going to use the hash function directly because using hash functions directly has historically caused a lot of trouble. Uh, you've probably heard of length extension, rainbow tables. Maybe you've heard that you need to salt your hashes or put pepper on them, a variety of other spices. And it's all, it's all mysterious and complicated. And the reason is because hash functions directly are a pretty fragile construction. So instead, we're going to build something on top of hashes that takes care of most of those problems for us. And specifically, that construction is going to be called HMAC. So it's 2016. Whenever you think of a hash for a cryptographic purpose, you should instead use HMAC. And in Go, using HMAC looks a lot like initializing any other hash interface, because it is one. The only difference is that it takes this additional parameter, which I'm calling a tag. And what the tag does is it serves to differentiate a particular invocation of HMAC from all of the differently tagged invocations, even if they're run over the same data. And you can see in this example, what I'm doing is using an English language string that, because you don't have all of these uh, random, you know, in you can go back and say, okay, safely done with SHA-2. And that's, that's it. That's how you should hash data in 2016. It's very simple but it's actually not suitable for everything. There is one glaring exception when you should never use this, and that is hashing passwords. I'm gonna assume that some of you have encountered this problem before. Anyone? Right, so hashing passwords, completely different situation. And it's almost the opposite situation, in fact, because what you want in a hash for data is high performance. You want it to be blazing fast, uh, as fast as it can possibly be, so that you can hash your data and get on with your life. But with passwords, what we're concerned about is these huge database dumps that happen every other week, where somebody starts trying to brute force the original passwords given the hashes from the database. So because you want that to be hard, you need the hash to be slow. You actually have a purpose-built algorithm that is specifically designed to be slow. And that sounds non-intuitive and complicated and probably really fiddly and hard to figure out. But I, in fact, can summarize it in two words. Use bcrypt. <laughs> Just use bcrypt. If you are hashing a password, you should never use SHA-2 or HMAC or SHA-3 or anything else. Just use bcrypt. It's built into Go. It's specifically designed for password hashing. And you can use it with these two functions. Generate from password and compare hash and password. So this is when you're creating an account and this is when you're checking a login. And the only subtlety here is that 14 uh, at the end of this generate call. That's, uh, that's a parameter called the work factor and it's the scale of how slow you want bcrypt to be. And 14 is a pretty good value for it. It's a little bit on the edge of future proofing, but it's 2016. We're writing Go. It's probably going to run on a server, so we can take a couple extra milliseconds to make it harder to crack our databases. But if you do find that this is too slow, you can maybe go as low as 12. Don't go below 12. And in fact, you should probably just use 14. So that's it for hashes. And we, we now come to the most complex part of this little walkthrough, which is signatures. Uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with signatures, but if not, you've got a key pair, a private key and a public key. And anyone who has the private key can sign a message that anyone with the public key can verify, which means that they can tell two things about it. One, that it hasn't been altered since the signature, and two, that they're pretty confident about who wrote it because only the corresponding private key can generate signatures that the public key can verify. You see this mostly in the context of software updaters, probably. Your package manager on your laptop does this constantly. And as you'd expect, Go has these. 
Go has a lot of them. But it's hard to talk about these as concretely as everything else I've talked about because it's a lot more complex. You can't really tell on the basis of the algorithm you've chosen whether or not your use of signatures is going to be secure. It's a lot more tied to how you actually use them than it is the algorithm you choose. And since they're all appropriate for different situations, it's, it's actually really hard to say concrete, actionable things about which one you should and shouldn't use. But, um, you know, don't worry. I have an opinion here. <laughs> so, specifically, well, that's completely ruined. Anyway, my, my, my specific opinion here is that you should use ECDSA P256. And any actual cryptographers in the audience are probably groaning right now because ECDSA is infamous. It's caused a lot of problems over its lifetime because it's kind of fiddly to use. Specifically, misusing ECDSA is what broke the PS3 and what allows you to empty Bitcoin wallets from poorly, uh, from poorly written software. When you mess up ECDSA, it fails hard. But the good news here is that Go has a painstakingly constructed constant time assembly implementation of P256 ECDSA. It, it protects us from all of the common pitfalls that people use to attack ECDSA. It's constant time, so there are no timing side channels, and it uses a protected nonce construction, which probably doesn't mean very much to you, but what it does mean is that the problem that broke the PS3 and most Bitcoin uh, wallet software that's messed this up just don't apply at all. So because we're using Go, we get to use this uh, rather performant and very widely supported algorithm that other languages might have to, uh, might have to skip. But ECDSA is not quite as straightforward as, as AES, for instance. The keys are not just random values that you can pull out of uh, dev u random. They actually have some mathematical structure, which means that we have to use this helper function to generate keys. The important part of this is that we're telling it specifically, again, that we want P256 because Go's other NIST curve implementations are vulnerable to side channels and we just don't want that. Once we've got that private key, here's how we sign a message. We take a digest of the data that we want to sign because ECDSA operates on uh, fixed width digests and because we're using P256, we'll also use SHA-256 to generate our digests. Once we have that, we'll feed it to the package level ECDSA sign function. And I say package level specifically because there is another sign function in the ECDSA package uh, for the ecdsa.private key type. And the reason that's there is so that private key implements uh, crypto signer, which lets you use it for hardware backed signing and such. But for most purposes, we're not doing that. And because there's no corresponding verify function there, we're going to use the package level ones that do have a verify function. The output of an ECDSA signature is RNS. These are two enormous big ends. And what we do with them is uh, about as straightforward as you can possibly expect it to be. We're going to encode them uh, big Indian order, slam them together into a signature, and return that. And on the validation side, we're going to take the public key, again generate a SHA-256 digest, and we're going to unmarshal that signature format, and we're going to call the package level ECDSA verify with the public key, the digest, and the two big ends. So, we've gone from this whole huge list of options, and we've talked about encryption, hashes, and signatures, and we've reduced it to three reasonable options. If you're writing Go in 2016 or at any time in the future, and you have the choice, these are good defaults. AES GCM for encryption, HMAC SHA-2 for hashing, and ECDSA P256 for signatures.
Everyone's got all that, right? Did you think you could maybe answer a few questions or like come up and write some code? Yeah, it's somewhere around here. Excellent. But, uh, let's give George a round of applause. That was awesome. Hang on, hang on. Oh, 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 oh. So my, my point there is that this is actually really fiddly and hard to remember. So what I've actually done is written it all down in, fuck. <laughs> anyway, you can kind of see, right? I've, I've written it all down as a sort of library. And I would like you to take this and go back to your companies and have an opinion. Tell people what, they're, what they should be doing. You are welcome to steal my rant. You are welcome to steal my code. All of this is public domain, and it's formatted specifically so that the functions are independent of each other and easy to copy and paste. So instead of hitting up Stack Overflow for like, how do I hash some data, just go here, use this. It'll be the recommendation from this talk. And now I'm done. <laughs>